and they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. But no matter how big or powerful they may appear, you must never forget that this nation does not belong to them. This nation belongs to you. Belongs to you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to a brand new episode of Into the Lion's Den here on, of course, the Heavy Hitter Network. Uh, wow, we are like just over 20% through this NFL season, if you can believe it. Already, that quick, we are talking about week five coming up this Sunday from Ford Field. Uh, guys, very, very excited to get to this show. Um, huge show planned for you again. Um, we did our longest show last week. I did not mean for it to go that long, so I'm going to try and uh, get a little bit quicker through this. But uh, at the same time, I felt like we had really good content and had great viewership. The views skyrocketed last week. So every week that this show has been out this season, it has progressively gotten more and more views every week. So for that... I say thank you because you guys must be sharing the show and uh, the numbers are definitely reflecting it. So I really do appreciate that. And I hope everybody is enjoying uh, what I'm doing. And uh, I, every week I try and just improve something. I try and either just refresh, uh, you know, one of the backgrounds or, or make it cleaner or fix the audio a little bit. You know, whatever I can do, fix the lighting, whatever I can do to just completely uh, make this show enjoyable if you guys are taking your time to watch the show the least i can do is put in my best effort every week to bring you guys something worth listening to so thank you thank you thank you uh, as always you can find this show on rumble at hh network or you can go to youtube and search heavy hitter network and find the channel there as well uh, this is not the only show i do have up this is currently the only show I've been putting out uh, recently, but I've got a lot of old uh, spotlight shows, which is very heavy music, uh, just um, all different genres of music, uh, old R&B, uh, rock, classic rock, so country, um, Christian hip hop. I mean, it, it literally runs the gamut of, uh, of, of music. So definitely some shows I think you guys would enjoy. Uh, if you are a fan of music, no doubt about that. So definitely go check those out as well. But tonight we are here to talk into the Lions Den, Detroit Lions, NFL, weeks four and five. We're going to get you fully caught up, guys. Uh, so you know what? Without further ado, like I always say, I want to get right into this thing. But as always, what do I have to do first? Well, I've got to, I've got to tell you about uh, the hotline. If you guys ever want to have your voice be heard, uh, either giving an opinion or asking a question or a suggestion, whatever it is you guys got on your mind, you can always call our hotline 1-616-258-6386. I would love to hear from you guys. And like I always say, if nothing else, if you have no question, no issue, no anything, still get on that phone, call that number, and just tell us where you're from. Where are you listening from? And if you don't want to call and do that, then just leave it in the comment section below the video. I would love to know where everybody is watching from. Uh, always find that fun. 
And then as always, like we're gonna do throughout the show, we're just gonna throw up the little tip jar. And that is for you guys, if uh, if you enjoy the show, if you want to show me a little love, you can always throw a little something in the tip jar, which is through Venmo. So you'll see that pop up every now and then. And again, the reason I do that is because I don't wanna waste my time sitting here doing commercials uh, for maybe products I don't believe in or just wasting your guys' time having to listen through commercials. So I figure the only way I'm gonna do this is just through funding from you guys and that is through the tip jar. So uh, it's not mandatory. It's only voluntary. If you feel like the performance that you uh, were, were given was worthwhile and, and uh, worth a tip. So that's going to do that. Let's get in now to the content because that's what I'm here for. And that's what I love to do. So let's jump into it. It was a Thursday night game for the Lions last week uh, heading to Green Bay. And this was a game... That I was very uh, anxious to, 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 to see because Jordan Love uh, has surprised me so far this season. Uh, I did not expect much from Jordan Love this season, to be honest. And he has looked really good uh, through the first three weeks. So for him to be home against a division rival, um, against an up-and-coming, as they were still kind of being talked about, Detroit Lions team, uh, yeah, it was going to be an interesting matchup for, for both sides. For the Lions, are we for real? Were we legit? You know, we beat Green Bay two times last season. So uh, if we could not have beat Green Bay in Green Bay, it would have definitely been a step back, right? So let's get to it. Okay, so going into this game, uh, both these teams entered this game ranked first and second in scrimmage yards from rookies. These are both two young teams, but a lot of talent in the rookie category. Uh, the Lions came in first. They had 386 uh, total scrimmage yards, 247 of those from the receiving side of the ball, 139 from the rushing side of the ball. The Packers, second with 371 scrimmage yards, 363 coming from their receivers, which doesn't surprise me and then eight coming from the rushing category. In the first half, the Lions outrushed the Packers, get this, just the first half, 121 to seven. And they outpassed them 163 to 13. Again, just in the first half. The Lions defense in the first half, four sacks and an interception. The second half, the Lions had 27 passing yards and 90 rushing yards. The Packers in the second half, 190 passing yards, 20 rushing yards. Second half, though, the Lions defense did add one more sack, one more pick. Uh, Lions had the ball almost 18 minutes more than the Packers. Run the ball. Control the clock, the recipe to success. Look, the Lions came out on fire, and uh, they had a hard time matching the intensity in the second half. It was kind of surprising to see, but what it told me was that, look, this team is still young. Like, we forget because of how talented they are. This is still a very young team. And also... The Lions aren't used to jumping out on a team that dominant, that big, that early. So it really was something that they have to learn how to win, especially big leads. Big leads are tough for any team because it's hard to keep that hunger when you are literally just smashing the other side. You know, the intensity, you, you kind of get relaxed. And I think that's really what happened. But I also think that was a good lesson for the Lions because what they did is, you know what? When Green Bay came out and they scored first thing in the second half, they came out, they put together a good drive. It kind of had made the Lions have to wake up and realize, hey, we still are in a game here. This thing could turn around on us and, and go south really quick. So it was good to see. It was good to see that the Lions found the energy again 
to at least finish off the win. Uh, the last time the Lions started 3-1 and one was 2017, but check this out. They actually finished that season with a record of 9-7 and seven and ended up missing the playoffs. Matter of fact, out of the 23 previous times the Lions have started 3-1, and one, they only made the playoffs in seven of those seasons. That's 30%. So this is still definitely a season that, uh, you know, we, we, got, we can be excited, we can celebrate, we can do all that. But I'm just saying, by average, when the Lions have started this way in their history, only 30% of the time have they made the playoffs. So we've got to relax a little bit, but at the same time, guys, Cloud nine. Cloud nine with how I'm feeling about the Detroit Lions right now. This team is absolutely just living up to the hype. Now, again, I'm still, I'm still a little uh, disappointed with that Seattle game because I'm telling you guys that game we should have won and it was bad coaching that, that cost the, the team. But even with that, to be three and one right now at this point in the season, especially starting off against Kansas City. And you know, the the big news media, the sports networks, they're absolutely now, I feel, believers of the Detroit Lions. The Detroit Lions got a ton of love this weekend. Um, you know, everybody was talking about them, even in other games. On Sunday, the Lions came up in topic. That's how impressive they have been. So that tells me the Lions are finally getting the respect. And, and, and you know what? It's about time. It's about time. So for my final take, that's exactly what I'm starting with. Lions are finally being taken serious by the sports media. And it feels good. And you know what? Like I just said, it's about time. This team has absolutely been on a tear this season. And for them to start the season off, not only playing Kansas City, but in Kansas City and beating Kansas City. And now to go to Lambeau. Those are basically two of the hardest places to play on the road. And the Lions have knocked them both off in a matter of four weeks. So very big, very big statement there. And that's what I'm talking about with this Green Bay game. This game was a tone setter for moving forward. This showed what this Lions team is capable of at any game. Any game. Because let's not get it twisted. Look, the Packers got dominated. The Packers are not a horrible team. So what happened? Well, these are two of the things that I really jumped out to me that uh, I think we can go to. In this game, the Packers missed 13 tackles, eight of them against Montgomery. And what a nice surprise that was to have Montgomery come back. But he is an absolute beast. And 13 missed tackles by the Packers on Thursday night. The Lions, they only missed two tackles. Also, the Lions had 120 rushing yards after contact. After contact. The Packers only had 17 yards running after contact. Again, it's the, it's the whole point about this team is the toughness. This team is tough. They play with a lot of fire. They fight for every yard. It's very rare that you see any of these Lions go down easy. Their legs keep turning. They keep scrapping. And, and you've got to gang tackle these guys. If you go in weak against the Lions, they will run you over or they will run right past you. And it goes across the board on this team. So very, very good stuff there. And uh, so that's kind of what my thoughts were while this game was going, when it got done, I always just like to jot down some things. 
And so for me, that was my final take. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to just go and take a quick comparison between Aaron Rodgers and Jordan Love through their first four games. I put who they played, what happened, and you can see Jordan Love is doing a great job. Two and two records for both men. Aaron Rodgers, 126 passes, 78 completions. Jordan Love, actually, a few more passes, 132, 74 completions. Yards, 961 for Rodgers, 901 for Love. Touchdowns, 6 for Rodgers, 8 for Love. Interceptions, identical, 3 interceptions. Quarterback ratings, Rodgers, 91.4. Love, 88. So, why I wanted to do that was because I kind of wanted to just see. It was a personal thing I just wanted to do, and I thought, well, I'll just share my info with, with you guys. But I get it. It's only four games. But like I say, Jordan Love is showing me a lot of good stuff early on. Now, their schedule is tough, so he's going to get tougher competition. He's stepped into the first tough competition, really, against the Lions. And to watch, you know, how he performed, it was good to see. It was really good to see. And with that, we go to the head-to-head -head stats. And you can see, passing yards, Green Bay out past us, 203 to 190. Each quarterback had a passing touchdown. Quarterback ratings, well, here you go. Goff. 86.9 to Jordan Love, 69.9. Rushing yards was the name of the game. The Lions can literally run the ball right down your throat. And there's really nothing you can do about it with the offensive line that we've got. Rushing yards, Lions 211 to the Packers 27. Yards per carry, Lions almost five yards a carry. Packers 2.3. Rushing touchdowns, oh yeah. Montgomery had three touchdowns on the night. Green Bay, just one. Third down percentage, the Lions, 41% on third down percentage. Green Bay, just 27. Fourth downs, well, fourth downs, we were two for two. Green Bay was one for one. Red zone, Lions, 50%, three of six. Green Bay, two of four. Interceptions, Lions had two, Green Bay had one. No fumbles. Lions had eight tackles for losses while Green Bay had six. Lions had five sacks. Green Bay had two. Lions had 11 quarterback hits. Green Bay had six. Uh, special teams, punting average, 45 for the Lions, 51 for Packers. Uh, kick returns, yeah, about 28 for the Lions, 23 for the Packers. Time of possession, 38 minutes, basically. 37 minutes, 58 seconds for the Lions. 22 minutes for the Green Bay Packers. Big, big advantage there. Almost 16 minutes difference. But again, like I said, you run the ball, you control the clock, and there's a lot of good that comes out of that. But when you look at the, the details of this game, head-to-head, -head, out of the categories that we measure, the Lions won 12 categories to the Green Bay's three. This was an absolute dominant performance by the Detroit Lions. Absolutely dominant. The rookie report for this week, Jameer Gibbs had eight carries for 40 yards, four catches for 11 yards. Jack Campbell had three more solo tackles and one for a loss. Sam Laporta, four catches, 56 yards, continues to impress. And Brian Branch, seven tackles, five of them solo, one pass defended. I'm telling you right now, Brian Branch was a steal, a steal in this year's draft. 
He got a little banged up. And we'll go over the injury report in a little bit later in the show. But I'm really hoping that uh, that Branch is good to go because he is a major piece. But like we've seen in this early part of the season, the Lions have depth. I've said that from day one. We've had to show it. We continue to show it. But at the same time, you just you don't want to lose a player like Brian Branch. He is a game changer. So, like I say, we'll do an injury report later on in the show, and Brian Branch is one of them that we will definitely will be discussing. Recapping the North, the Broncos and Bears. The Broncos won the game 31-28. to The Bears now fall to 0-4. Going through this game, the Bears jumped out to an early 28-7 lead that they held all the way to the third quarter. 28-7 in the third quarter, and they didn't win. With just 14 seconds left, Russell Wilson hit Brandon Johnson with a four-yard touchdown with just 14 seconds left in the third quarter. That started the comeback. Justin Fields was sacked and fumbled. Jonathan Cooper picked it up, ran it back 35 yards, and that was the, the score that at that point tied the game 28-28. Still six minutes, 55 seconds to go. The Bears answered back with an 11-play drive going down to the Broncos' 18-yard line. Now, fourth and one with just 2.52 left on the clock, the Bears chose to go for it instead of kicking the go-ahead field goal. And guess what? The Bears did not convert. Therefore, the Broncos would then get the ball on downs. They would get in field goal range. Will Lutz would line up for a 51-yard field goal. And with just a minute six left, the Broncos would take a 31-28 lead. So then, with just one last drive, and now down by three, the Bears would get the ball, and Justin Fields would end up throwing an interception to Broncos' Kareem Jackson. Broncos win. Guys, I said it before, I will say it again. I absolutely hate going for it on fourth down when you are in field goal range. And the Bears did it with 18 yard line. 18 yard line. You're basically kicking an extra point to go ahead at home with. Just about three minutes to go. And you are saying we've got no confidence in our defense, which for really three quarters of the game held this team to just seven points. But you have no confidence. So you're going to basically go for one yard and you lose the game at home because of that. Unbelievable. And you know what? Yeah, maybe the Bears wouldn't have been able to hold stop the Broncos. But at least you would have been up by three. You would have been forcing them now to have to, you know, match your three or try and get better than your three and score a touchdown. But I'm telling you, all these teams that are going for fourth downs and missing, they're absolutely killing their own team's momentum and giving the momentum to the other side. So, horrible call, horrible game for the Bears. Uh, look, Justin Fields continues to just be a, a train wreck, a complete train wreck. So, both these teams are horrible. Let's not get it twisted. Russell Wilson and the Broncos got their first win of the season. They can't be feeling great. They, they had a pretty ugly game as well. But, uh, you know. Fields on the day, 28 of 35, 335 yards, four touchdowns. But again, had the interception, had the fumble, sacked four times. 
Russell Wilson, uh, 21 to 28, 223 yards, three touchdowns, no picks. He was sacked once, but, you know, he, he had a pretty solid game. He really did. When it was all said and done, he did good. But again, this is the Bears. So I'm not overly, uh, I'm not going to say that the, the Broncos are back. That hey, now they're now they figured it out. No, they just had a easy opponent. But three turnovers by the Bears was really the key to this one. Interception, fumble, turnover on downs, and then the Broncos had no turnovers. So every time that's going to be a problem. As far as the Vikings taking on the Panthers, Adam Thielen being able to take on his old team. The Vikings finally get their first win of the season. They now are 1-3. The Panthers go to 0-4. Adam Thielen, like I say, after 10 seasons with the Vikings, finally got to take on his old team. And uh, I'm sure that was emotional for him. I'm sure it was. But, uh, you know, came up short. Just came up short against his team. Um, and I like the I do like this Carolina team. I think they've got hints of of talent, but just too soon for them. Vikings entered the game ranked 21st in the red zone touchdown rate and 26 in goal to go. And to me that really tells a lot about this Vikings team. They can they can go down the field on you, up and down the field on you all day. They have a hard time finishing their drives. Uh, also, the Vikings introduced their newest addition, Cam Akers, um, into this game. However, Alexander Madison was still the main go-to guy in this one. We'll see if that changes as the weeks progress. But in this one, Cam Akers had five carries for 40 yards. Uh, the Panthers' defense was holding the Vikings in check for most of the first half. Uh, it really looked like the Vikings um, could have some problems. They had an early mistake um, with an interception by Kirk Cousins on the first drive of the game that was returned for a touchdown. And it just it just makes you feel like, here we go again. But that was one of the things uh, after the game that the, the team, the Vikings, were were kind of proud of was that they didn't go into here we go again mode they did continue to fight and they ended up getting the win but i'm telling you right now these turnovers for this team this season are absolutely ridiculous uh bryce young who had had an ankle injury he returned this game he actually played a fairly clean game and that's why i say this young talent Definitely the quarterback, but then the other young pieces in this ball club, they've got something special. I think Bryce Young is going to be a very good NFL quarterback. It's just, this is going to be the learning season. But I think he's a smart guy. I think he's athletic as all can be. And I think that'll that'll work out for him. Um, it's just, I felt like they really, at times in this game, were going to run away with this one. But the Vikings, to their credit, kept fighting. Um, a late third quarter fumble by Bryce Young really ended up giving uh, not only the Vikings the lead, but really stole the momentum. I mean, up until that point, the, the Panthers were up. They were up and they were rolling and they were just going with this game. And the Vikings offense was really stagnant, to be perfectly honest. But it was the defense of the Vikings that really got this thing going. And, and that's why I say the win in this one belongs to the Vikings defense. They fought through more turnovers by Kirk Cousins. And uh, even Justin Jefferson, I mean, two touchdowns on the day, but only 85 yards. You know, he didn't break open like he can. So I really feel like both defenses came out and, and did pretty good in this one. It was just the Vikings that took advantage, I guess, more of, of the of the turnover. Both quarter, quarterbacks, though, giving up basically touchdowns in this one because of turnovers that they had. And and that's big. Uh, 
yeah, I think that's about all I got to say on that one. Cousins, again, I, I mean, I've talked about him every week, it seems like, but I'm I'm just not impressed. I'm just not impressed. I, I, I feel like this win comes despite Kirk Cousins. He was 12 of 19, 139 yards. He had two touchdowns, and he had two picks. You, you can't keep turning the ball over. So the Vikings are going to have a tough, tough season if Kirk Cousins just cannot figure out how to not turn the ball over. And it's crazy because he, he's he got a great arm. He can throw for lots of yards. But it makes you wonder, you know, <laughs> how this season's going to go. And speaking of that, let's get to some notes from the North. For the Bears, Chase Claypool was a healthy scratch. Ember Flo said... Claypool was given the choice to show up or not, but reports came out after the game by a Bears spokesperson that said the player was told not to attend Sunday's game. More drama in Chicago. Uh, Claypool did express frustration about his usage earlier in the week, so we're not sure if that had something to do with it. But I'm also reading now that uh, Claypool, again, away from the team this coming week. He will not play this week with the Bears again. So that is a trade piece I'm sure that we're going to be hearing about very, very soon going on the move. Everflu said that actives and inactives are determined weekly by evaluating meetings and walkthroughs. Bears who did not have a win gambled on fourth down instead of taking the lead. So that brought up a question to me. Is it time to fire Matt Everflu? And you know, at times... Teams have to just change a coach just to change a coach. Even if they don't feel like that's the right move, sometimes you'll see it because you can't really change the players. You can drop a player here or there, but it really, at the end of the day, it's the coach that always has to eat for a poor playing team. And I'm thinking Eberflus is going to be on the hot seat really, really soon, and I think it's the right decision. And by him going for it on fourth down there, it gives you every reason to do it. So we'll see how this plays out. But right now, you've got a mess in Chicago, and it just keeps getting messier. Now they got Chase Claypool, who was supposed to be a weapon for their quarterback. Uh, now he's not even showing up. Not even to practices, by the way. I mean, he is completely away from the team. So yeah, this is a hot mess. For the Packers, like I say, Packers youth was exposed. This team is just not on the level of the Lions right now. And that's not a bad, that's not a diss. It really isn't. The Lions have been building this team for the past few seasons. The Packers are kind of just hitting their reset button, and this is the first year of it. So they're just at two different points of their rebuilds, and, and that got exposed. But what I will say is, I still feel, as we sit here right now, the Packers are still the second best team in the North. And I don't even think it's close with the way the other two teams are playing. The Bears are a laughing stock. And while I've said everything I had to say about the Vikings and their turnovers, Vikings defense stepped up to help their team get the victory. But Kirk Cousins continues to be a liability. So my question coming out of the Vikings is, do the Vikings start looking to trade Cousins? Because I'm sure they would be able to trade him. I'm sure there's teams that might want him. I mean, let's talk about the New York Jets. There were rumors floating out, I want to say a week or two weeks ago about that. I don't know if that was just somebody writing a hit piece that just wanted to get some clicks. Or how much truth there was to that. But that actually makes a lot of sense. Maybe you just swap the quarterbacks. Just give them both a change of scenery. I don't know. Does Zach Wilson fit in, in Minnesota with those awesome wide receivers? I love the Vikings receiving core. But, you know, I, I don't know. Something I would definitely consider. though. And if you're a Vikings fan, uh, you know, would you be for that? Would you be for trading Kirk Cousins? Maybe not to the Jets, but just, just in general. Are you ready to to move on from Kirk Cousins, or do you still feel like he gives you a chance to win? 
I would love to know your opinion on that one. But as we look at the standings after four weeks, it is the Detroit Lions now in first place all by themselves with a record of 3-1, and one, followed by the Green Bay Packers who are 2-2, two and two, the Minnesota Vikings now 1-3, and three, and the Chicago Bears still looking for that first win of the season. Point differentials on the season, the Lions are up 23 points from their opponents, the, Bear, the Packers are up 4 points, the Vikings are down 5, and the Bears are down 62 points. That is a big deal. Let's go through the other games real quick here. The Jaguars and the Falcons from London. Jaguars return to form. They are now 2-2, two and two, as well as the Falcons, who have now dropped two in a row. Atlanta came in winning the last four of five versus the Jaguars. Desmond Ritter had his second worst game of his career with a quarterback rating of 62.7. Desmond threw two interceptions on back-to-back -back drives, the first one going all the way back for a touchdown. Trevor Lawrence had maybe his best game of the season so far. He was 23 of 30, 207 yards, one touchdown, no interceptions, plus he had eight rushes for 42 yards. Really, really good game for Trevor Lawrence. The Falcons fell behind early, which caused them to have to throw more than run. And you know my feelings about the Falcons. I've said it before. I feel like this is a run first team. But again, when they fall behind, they get exposed because that means Desmond Ritter is now carrying the load. And well, against a defense like the Jaguars, that is not going to be the answer. Bijan Robinson rushed 14 times for 105 yards. So he was averaging 7.5 per carry. But again, because they fell behind, they just kind of had to go away from that game plan. Now, I think they might should have stuck with it and seen how things panned out because that was definitely uh, working. But they just, I feel like they, they felt like they had to get in a shootout with the Jaguars. Christian Kirk and Kelvin Ridley each had receptions of 30 yards to help the Jags stretch a the field. These are dangerous receivers for the Jaguars. Very underrated receivers. And then Kyle Pitts remains quiet this season. He was targeted four times and only had two catches for 21 yards. Still has not reached the end zone for the Falcons. So the Falcons now on the backside of their of the uh, the win streak here. They they won the first two games of the season. Now they're on a two game lose streak. We'll see how they respond. But I'm starting to feel like the Falcons are really being exposed for just being a running team, and that's going to really make it hard for Bijan Robinson to run. Like I say, this game he was running well, but the team fell behind early, and it just it took that part of the game uh, out of the strategy. My opinions on the Toy Story game. I told you I was going to check it out. I didn't know how long I was going to be able to, to watch it all. Not very long. Um, look, this might be cool for for little kids to turn on the game, and it might be a way for the NFL to try and get kids into football. I don't know what the whole reasoning was behind it. Um, look, if they would have, I, I don't even know. I, I honestly don't know how this would have been better. Um, it was silly. It was, you know, definitely childlike. And I just felt like it was um, pretty much unnecessary. Like, I really don't know, other than them trying to get kids into football, what any other reason would be to do this. Um, you can see the dog there in the picture. They used him for the first down markers. And, you know, they did little stuff like that. You can see, like, the candy crane right above the players there. They used that to place the football uh, every time. So, I mean, they did little fun stuff like that, which was creative. You can see the announcer in the background, Booger McFarland. They're uh, kind of to the left of the players in the back. Um, so they did a lot of weird stuff. But it was it was just, it was not good. It was not good at all. And I kind of figured that going in. But like I say, I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to react honestly. And I wanted to give it a fair shot. And 
Um, I probably watched... I don't, it was the first score I know because that was one of the other things that was really bad. Um, it was I can't remember what who uh, who scored on it, but it was one of the touchdowns by the Jaguars, I believe, and it was a pass in the end zone, and the graphics made it look like the ball was not caught because the ball just wasn't connected to the player. It was like on the ground, and then the announcer said touchdown, and I'm thinking, what the heck did I just miss? So right there, it was like, okay, if I'm not going to get the, you know, an accurate depiction of the game, then why am I going to stay here and watch this? So I turned it off, uh, went to the regular game, watched the normal broadcast, and then about two minutes before halftime, I turned it back to the animated game uh, just to give it another quick shot, see what it was like, I wanted to see what they were going to do at halftime. Uh, they had a Daredevil character from the movie Toy Story uh perform at halftime and then that was where i turned it off and and then i went back to the regular uh broadcast for the rest of the game but uh in my opinion and maybe i'm being too rough on it maybe i'm i'm thinking of it the wrong way but i, I just feel like it was a complete fail and um uh, the only thing that i did say uh when i was watching it is if you were one of these players and you have a little you know you have a child at home that's a Toy Story fan. I mean, that's got to be kind of cool to be able to tell them, like, hey, I'm going to be playing in Andy's room. You know, because at that point, the, some of the kids, when they're at a certain age, they don't even realize animation versus reality. And, you know, so for them to think that's their dad sitting there playing in Andy's room, yeah, that might be a kind of a cool experience for the kid, I guess. But uh, just for me, it was a, it was a no. It was a, something I would never uh, hope that they do again. Um, I'm not even a fan of the London games, to be honest, but that's that's my opinion. I just feel like they're forcing it down their throats. Um, when you look at the games and uh, you look at them playing in London, you see a lot of empty seats still. Yeah, you see fans that, you know, have the jerseys and are cheering really bad and you know, are really good, I guess. But th to me, I, I sit there and I wonder, like, are some of these fans plants? Like, are, is the NFL putting plants in the stadium to make it look like people are really enjoying their game because they're just look at the end of the day they're going for the dollar. This is this is absolutely a money grab. I don't really think the NFL cares if London loves the game. What they want is a bigger audience so they can bring in more money, sell more merchandise. It's absolutely a money grab, and that's why it just is a turnoff to me from the moment they they wanted to do this. I just I don't see the point. Look, it's okay if not everybody loves the NFL. <laughs> like, there's some countries that just, they like soccer, or they like tennis, or they like golf, or they like, you know, rugby. But the NFL goes in there, and they just try and cram it down these people's throat. And that, that's just what it feels like to me. So every time I see it, just kind of a turn off. All right, now the rest of the games uh, from the week four, Buffalo. Miami, this was one I was really looking forward to. Two really good teams. This is going to be the battle for the AFC East, no doubt. But Buffalo, after Miami had the just offensive outbreak last week, Buffalo hosted these hot Dolphins and really dominated them. Let's let's just call it what it was. Uh, both teams now go to 3-1. and one. Dolphins finally get a loss. But Buffalo came into this game winning seven straight against the Dolphins. Miami came into the game with the top-ranked rushing and passing yards. The Dolphins outrushed the Bills on the day, 19 carries, 142 yards, two touchdowns, 7.5 per carry, where the, the Buffalo Bills were only 3.6 yards per carry. They also had two touchdowns did run for over 100 yards, so it's not like they had a horrible day, but the Dolphins were definitely running the ball better. Devon Ashane again had another big day. That was not just a one-hit wonder last week. He had another big game. Eight carries, 101 yards, two touchdowns. So I was skeptical of picking him up in fantasy last week. I was like, no way, I'm not picking this guy up. This is a one-hit wonder. You probably will never you know, get points like this again. And whoever did go out and took the chance on them, they had to be happy. So we'll see. See if this keeps going for the Dolphins. Looks like they might have found a new player. 
Uh, Buffalo took a 31-14 lead into halftime, which caused the Dolphins to run less and pass more again. They fell behind. They felt like they were going to be in a shootout, and they didn't feel like they could really continue to run the ball like they wanted to. Buffalo's passing attack, though, was absolutely on fire. Josh Allen, 21 of 25 against a very good Miami defense. 320 yards, four touchdowns, plus he ran the ball four more times and got another touchdown. Stefan Diggs, six receptions, 120 yards, three touchdowns. Tua threw one interception that eventually led to the Bills to led the Bills to a touchdown and had a fumble that led to three more points. So 10 points off of turnovers by Tua. So that was a big part of this as well. The Dolphins were 0-3 on fourth down attempts. Again, fourth downs being attempted, not being converted, and that team ends up losing. It's, it's just, you know, it's just, I'm not saying every fourth down is completely wrong, but I am saying probably 95% of them are. That's how strongly I feel about it. Ravens beat the Browns by a big score of 28 to 3. Browns now fall to 2 and 2. The Ravens are 3 and 1. And you know, look, uh the Browns came in having one of the best defenses. They were allowing the fewest points per game at 10.7. And the fewest passing yards, 111 per game. So very good defense by the Browns. Deshaun Watson, he was out. He was still dealing with a sore shoulder that he suffered in week three. So Dorian Thompson Robinson, the fifth round pick out of UCLA, made his first start. And I'm just saying when this is game is played again, if Deshaun Watson is in there, I do expect a different result. Now, I'm not saying the Browns are going to necessarily win the game, but it'll be a different game. It'll be a much closer game. Um, so, again, I mean, congratulations to the Ravens. But this had a lot of uh, the Dorian Thompson Robinson <laughs> was, was kind of the issue here. Let's be honest. He was 19 of 36, 121 yards, three interceptions, uh, a 25.3 rating. 25.3 rating. He also was sacked four times, which lost him another 48 yards. Um, it just, it wasn't good. It was not good. So congratulations to the to the Ravens on this one. But uh, yeah, the, the loss of Deshaun Watson, major factor in this one. Texans beating the Steelers 30 to 6. Both teams now go to 2 and 2. The Pittsburgh Steelers led the all-time series in these two teams 5 to 2, winning the last 4 of 5. But I've been telling you guys, the Texans are very interesting. CJ Stroud has been hot all season. This guy has come out playing a big game. They just have not gotten um, I think maybe the defense they've needed at times, they've made some mistakes at certain times, but this is a good team. The Texans are much better than people are giving them respect for. Uh, CJ Stroud came in six in the NFL for quarterbacks for passing yards, while the Steelers defense came in ranked 22nd versus a pass. So I should have told you that CJ Stroud was going to have a game. And C.J. Stroud did. He kept up his offensive output. 16 for 30, 306 yards, two touchdowns, no picks, no sacks. Just a very good game for C.J. Stroud. Can he pick it on the other hand? Look, they've got questions in Pittsburgh. They've got a lot of questions in Pittsburgh right now. Can he pick it? Not looking like the Kenny Pickett I think they thought they were going to get. He was 15 to 23, 114 yards on the day, no touchdowns. Had a pick, sacked three times, and then on top of that, the Texans' running game looked good. 38 carries, 139 yards. Damian Pierce uh, led the way, 24 carries, 81 yards. The Steelers on the day, 25 carries, 114 yards. Najee Harris led the team with 14 carries and 71 of those yards. But like I say, the Texans are underrated on both sides of the ball. They're fourth in passing yards per game. 
Defense is 13th on yards allowed per game and 11th in points per game. So this defense is, is good. C.J. Stroud is good. You know, they've got some talent. So I think this team's only going to get better as the weeks go along. But the Steelers, yeah. Is it time to hit the panic button on Kenny Pickett? Maybe. Maybe. I don't know how much, you know. He's very hot and cold. But right now, I, I'm just, I'm not seeing enough. So we'll see how the Steelers react to this. But this was a, this was a beatdown. Rams and Colts. Rams who I was very nervous about uh, Matt Stafford after last week's performance. I really thought maybe there was a, a hidden injury in there. But uh, he did look better in this game. Anthony Richardson was cleared to return from his concussion on Friday. That was good news for the Colts. Uh, I did not expect that. I did not expect him back that quick from the concussion, but it tells me it must not have been as a severe concussion as we thought early on. Uh, both teams, though, were still missing... They're Pro Bowlers. Cooper Cup still out for the Rams. Jonathan Taylor, of course, still out for the Colts. Stafford and the Rams scored on their first four drives, while the Colts had two punts, a fumble, and a missed field goal on their first four drives. So the Rams got out to a controlling lead. They led 20 to zip at halftime. Second half, yeah, they had different results. The Rams uh, suffered an interception. They missed a field goal and had three punts. Well, in that time, the Colts then scored three touchdowns. So it really was a tale of two halves. Teams were tied at 23 at the end of regulation. Rams won the coin toss. And on the eighth play of the drive, Stafford hit, you guessed it, Puka Nakua for a 22-yard touchdown to win the game. And the, 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 the story of Puka Nakua this season, I'm telling you, what a surprise. What a pleasant, pleasant surprise. When you don't have Cooper Cup and you think, man, what is this Rams team going to do? Puka Nakua stepped right in and filled that void. So like I say, both teams now go to 2-2. Two and two, And uh, good news for the Rams from what I took out of this thing was, was Stafford. Stafford looked healthy. And that's that was the key because I was really worried last week that, look, if Stafford goes down, these Rams are going down again too. That was exactly what happened to them last year. They can't afford to be without Stafford. And and now that he came back and, and had a really good game, I think, um, I now feel like uh, the Rams are, are something to be dealt with again. I feel very good about their chances of, of having a pretty good season this, this year. Bucks run the South. Uh, they now uh, are 3-1. and one. On the season, and I'm telling you right now, if anybody would have had uh, Baker Mayfield at three and one to start the season, I don't think anybody would have taken that. I'm telling you right now, Baker Mayfield is a great fit for this team. Uh, Derek Carr did play in his return from a shoulder injury. Not sure he should have, but he did. Uh, Alvin Kamara also returned for the Saints after a three game suspension for his uh, involvement in a man that was uh, beat up. Before the 2022 Pro Bowl, he finally has come back, and uh, he was given a full workload. They were not, you know, going to hold back on him. But Baker Mayfield continues to be a very pleasant story to the early part of this season. He had three touchdowns, going 25 of 32, 246 yards. That is now seven touchdowns on the season for Baker Mayfield. Derek Carr, on the other hand, I say I don't know if he should have came back because he was 23 of 37, 127 yards, no touchdowns, really didn't throw it deep, which makes me wonder, is he healthy or are they rushing him back? It's just not worth it. Uh, the Buccaneers were 3 for 4 in the red zone while the Saints were 0 for 2. Camara, like I say, they let him go, you know, Basically, they said before the game, he's going to get the workload. Well, the workload on this day, and it's probably because they were behind, but 11 carries, 51 yards. So if you have Kamara in fantasy, I would just go by what the coach said and consider him the starter for the Saints now moving forward. Saints also had three turnovers, two fumbles uh, by Carr and Prentice, 
And then one interception by Winston, who did have to come in for a little bit. But then uh, Derek Carr came back. So it was not a permanent uh, replacement. But in the little bit of time that Winston got in there, yeah, he threw a pick. And then the Buccaneers also threw one interception on the day. Commanders lose a tight one to the Eagles. Commanders led most of the day, but came up short. Lots of good takeaways in this game, though. Hertz definitely looked more like himself, and that's been a question early on this season. Washington and Sam Howell competed with a great team. That's really what Washington needs to take away from this. The, the Eagles are a really, really good team, and they played really, really well on this day. And Sam Howell, he, look, he did a great job. Great job. The last time these two teams met, the Commanders actually spoiled the Eagles' perfect season. And they were hoping to do it again. Because the Eagles came in 3-0. and The Eagles' defense came in holding teams to 48.3 rushing yards per game. While Washington's Brian Robinson Jr. came in with the longest active streak of 10 straight games with at least 50 rushing yards. Well, which side of that one? The Eagles. <laughs> Brian Robinson ended up 14 carries, 45 yards. He missed it by five yards. And he did have a touchdown on the day. The Eagles, they needed Jalen Hurts in this game to lead the way. And he was ready. He actually really looked like Jalen Hurts. 25 of 37, 319 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, 34 yards on the ground. It was a good day for Jalen Hurts. He's got to feel good coming out of this game. A.J. Brown also had a great great day. Nine catches, 175 yards, two touchdowns. DeAndre Swift, who's been running the ball really well for the Eagles, he actually was held in check by Washington. He had 14 carries, but just 56 yards. He did cross the goal line, though. And like I say, Sam Howell, good job all day, including the drive to tie the game late. On the day, Sam Howell was 29 of 41, 290 yards, one touchdown, no turnovers, and then also carried the ball six times for 40 yards. The big thing, and I mentioned this about a week or two weeks ago, I wondered if they were going to do it. Eagles performed the tush push in overtime on fourth and one, which then allowed Jake Elliott to kick the 54-yard game winner just six plays later. But there it was. And look, people want to go for it on fourth down? Maybe this tush push is really going to take off. Maybe it's not just a gimmick. Maybe this is absolutely something that you're going to see every play, uh, every team start doing on fourth and ones. Maybe fourth and ones will just become gimmies. You know, I, I don't know. But the Eagles definitely have it down to a science. They do it perfectly. So credit to them. And look, there's a fourth and one that worked out. Few and far between. But I did just ask, I think it was two weeks ago, I wonder if the Eagles would ever do this on a fourth down where it's not at the end zone. And there you go. The answer is yes, and the answer is it worked. Bengals continue to struggle. I'm telling you right now, this team, they need to hit the panic button. They definitely need to hit the panic button. Titans were coming off their worst offensive output in 49 years by just scoring or just having 94 combined yards last week. Joe Burrow was coming off his biggest passing performance of the season, 259 yards. The Titans' offensive line really set the tone for this game all day. Derrick Henry ran 22 times for 122 yards, had a touchdown and even threw a two-yard pass for a touchdown. But Derrick Henry's best form of he's going to have a good day is you know you're going to feed the guy. If he can get 20-plus uh, carries in a game, Derrick Henry's usually on the winning side. Like This is a guy that absolutely can control a game for his team. And Ryan Tannehill, look, he's nothing special. He's nothing special. But a lot of times it's just don't go, don't go out and lose the game for the team. Manage the team. 
manage, you know, manage the clock, manage your team, and let Derrick Henry do his thing. And just don't let Tannehill get in the way. And he really didn't. 18 of 25, 240 yards, one touchdown. He was picked off once and he was sacked three times. But Joe Burrow is, is the, the discussion that we need to have here. He's just struggling. Joe Burrow, 165 yards on the day. No, no touchdowns. Sacked three times. Bengals were two for nine on third downs. And 0 for 1 on fourth downs. And 0 for 1 in the red zone. The Bengals O-line has to get better. That's that's the answer. Joe Burrow right now does not have protection. And he is a completely different quarterback when he does not have protection. Titans outrush the Bengals on the day. 173 to 72. Titans rushed the ball 33 times total. The Bengals only 18 times. This was, again, a beatdown. Raiders, Chargers. Raiders came in leading the series all time. 68 wins, 57 losses, two ties. Jimmy Garoppolo was still out with his concussion, which meant Aiden O'Connell got the start. O'Connell on the day, 24 of 39, 238 yards. Made way too many mistakes for the Raiders to overcome. He was sacked seven times. He fumbled. He threw an interception. Just too much. Too much. Josh Jacobs was definitely the Raiders' number one weapon on the day. And he had 17 carries, 58 yards, a touchdown, eight receptions, 81 yards. He was trying the best he could do. But like I say, just too many turnovers in this one. Devontae Adams also had a pretty good day. Eight carry, or Eight catches, 75 yards. But the Chargers' defense looked great. Looked great. They held the Raiders 1 for 11 on third downs. They got you on third down, you're done. You're done. Chargers' defense also got two fumbles and an interception. And uh, the defense was really enough to control the day. But Justin Herbert on the day, 13 of 24, 167 yards, one touchdown, one interception. He seems a little off his game as well early on, but we'll continue to monitor right now the Chargers 2-2. and So people really aren't driving, you know, too crazy about what Justin Herbert's game has been so far. But this right here, not a typical Justin Herbert day. Joshua Kelly also, you know, 17 carries, 65 yards. I think they expected more out of him. I know I did when I took him in fantasy. Uh... He's not living up to my expectations. Let's put it that way. And then Joshua Palmer, three catches, 77 yards. But yes, the Chargers, uh, the score actually looks closer than the game felt like. Again, the defense was pretty dominant here for the Chargers. Patriots, Cowboys. Ezekiel Elliott returned to his former home against his former team. Really didn't do much on the day. Only had six carries, 16 yards. That was it. So he was not a factor in the game at all. Cowboys defense came in first in turnover differential and third in points allowed. Rushing and defense were big parts of the Cowboys' success. This defense, when they're clicking, and again, you know what? How I feel about the Lions losing to the Seahawks That's got to be the Cowboys losing to the Cardinals. Like, that was just not, it just wasn't. It was so out of character and and never really should have happened. But they they ride with that now. They're at 3-1. and They really should be 4-0 right now. But it is what it is. Dallas also rushed the ball 30 times in this game. 124 yards. That's a 4.1 average. Dallas's cornerback, Deron Bland, matched a career high with two interceptions in a game, taking one all the way back to the house. Cowboys defense also recovered a Mac Jones fumble. And can I just say, Mac Jones now is definitely got to be on the hot seat. Got to be on the hot seat. And I remember early on in this season, I want to say it was week one or two, 
I watched and actually might have been both weeks. I really was excited about what I saw from the Patriots. They they showed signs of looking like there might be something starting to gel there in New England. I feel completely different about this team now. And I get it. They're playing a great Cowboys team. But Mac Jones really could not have looked any worse. It was a absolute disaster. He was 12 of 21 on the day, 150 yards, no touchdowns, two picks. It just was not good. And then Ramondre Stevenson had 14 carries for 30 yards. I mean, they couldn't get anything going against this defense. Dak Brest got on the day. Pretty good day. 28-34, 261 yards, one touchdown, no picks. But it was defense, man. This defense is absolutely crazy. And spoiler alert, <laughs> they play the 49ers this coming week. And I'm telling you right now, I cannot wait to see that 49ers offense against this Cowboys defense and vice versa. I think that's going to be one heck of a game. But I think I think we might get a real sense of uh, if, if either one of these teams is faking and they're not as legit as they seem to be through the first four weeks, well, then we might see one of them get exposed. But I feel like both are legit. So this should be a great game coming up this week. Cardinals, 49ers. Speaking of the 49ers, 49ers go to 4-0. and oh. They came in winning 13 straight regular season games. They now make it 14 straight regular season games that they have now won. Cardinals came in sixth in the rushing yards category. 49ers third against the run. So you definitely had a matchup there that was going to be intriguing. Cardinals and 49ers, both 2-2 two and two over their last four meetings. They've split. Christian McCaffrey rushed for more yards than the entire Cardinals team. McCaffrey on the day, 20 carries, 106 yards, three touchdowns, plus he had seven catches, 71 yards, and another touchdown. He had a massive day. Brock Purdy also very good on the day, 20 of 21. He only had one incomplete pass, one incomplete pass all day. 283 yards, one touchdown, no picks. Brandon Ayuk came back, had a good day, six catches, 148 yards. 49ers were 5-5 five and five in the red zone and 3-5 for five on third down. They just, the Cardinals really had a hard time stopping this machine. Let's put it that way. Joshua Dobbs, I still like this guy. I think he is absolutely, look, he's going to make it hard for the Cardinals. Uh, what to do, you know, because right now he's performing. But 28 to 41, 265 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, 12 carries, 48 yards. He is an absolute uh, just gift. He's a gift for them this year. They did not, not expect, I don't think, to have this much success from their quarterback. Now, granted, they're one in three, but Joshua Dobbs is giving them a lot of opportunities and chances to win, and that's all you can ask for. James Conner on the day, 11 carries, 52 yards. We then went to Sunday night where the Chiefs were taking on the Jets. The Chiefs go to 3 and 1. The Jets go to 1 and 3. The Jets were the lowest scoring offense and lowest passing yards heading into this game. Chiefs had the fifth best offense in the NFL. Chiefs Led 17 points after the first quarter. Looked like this was going to be a just easy game, easy night for the Chiefs. But then Patrick Mahomes started to have some issues. Patrick Mahomes threw two picks in this game. Now, he did throw a touchdown, which makes him the fastest to 200 NFL touchdown passes more than anybody. Quickest, quicker than anybody for him, 200 touchdown passes. But he really didn't have his best night. He had a back-breaking run, though, late in the game. And that is the absolute definition of Patrick Mahomes. He did not throw his best. But when the team needed him on a third and 23, he ran 25 yards and picked up a first down. 
at a big point in the game. So that's that's what you say about Patrick Mahomes. But Zach Wilson, let's say it. He had a nice game. He had a really nice game. 28 of 39, 245 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. But unfortunately for him, also in crunch time, with at the time the Chiefs were only up by three, just removing the ball, seven and a half minutes left in the game, Wilson fumbled. He fumbled. And the Chiefs took the ball over at the 46-yard line. Devastating fumble. Because they really were. They were moving the ball down the field. If nothing else, you felt like they were definitely going to tie it up. But the ultimate killer for this game came when the Jets' defense had gotten an interception off of Mahomes with 4.29 to go in the game at the Jets' 14-yard line. The refs threw a flag, called defensive holding on Sauce Gardner, and that took away the interception. It gave the Jets a first down, or the Chiefs a first down, and it basically is the reason the Chiefs held on to win. That was an interception. And as far as the defensive holding, well, I put a little note on here so I would remember. I'm going to show you the defensive holding. And what I really want to talk about when we watch this is my issue with it. Is it defensive holding? Maybe. Yeah, you probably could call it defensive holding. My issue with it is I want you to watch the referee when he throws the flag for defensive holding. And this is where I have an issue with the NFL. And this is why I say... A lot of people think the NFL is rigged. And I was just having a conversation the other day at work. And a guy said, well, but yeah, but how would they really rig it, rig it, you know? They can rig it with plays just like this. And this is why I want you guys to watch this. I'm not disputing whether there was defensive holding or not. Now, I don't think it was aggressively defensive holding. I think if they wouldn't have thrown the flag, nobody would have been like, oh, he was holding. Why didn't they throw the flag? But my issue is, if you're going to throw the flag, throw the flag when you see the foul. Don't throw the flag when you see the interception. And that's what I feel like happened here. He did not throw that flag when the foul occurred. He absolutely threw the flag after the interception occurred. And that, to me, is inexcusable. You're either going to throw that flag for that foul or you're not. You don't wait to see what happens. I would love to know why he waited so long to throw the flag. But unfortunately for the NFL or for the fans of the NFL, these referees are never held accountable. These refs are never uh, expected to explain their actions. We just have to live with it. And these teams just have to live with it. And I'm telling you right now, this one, if I'm a Jets fan, I'm still pissed off today about it. Me not even being a Jets fan is still fired up about it just because, like I say, of where the ref threw the flag. So I'm going to roll the footage, and I just want you guys to watch it, and, and then, uh, you know, you can make up your own mind. But to me, the issue here is that he threw the flag way too late from when the foul occurred and way too convenient for when the turnover occurred. So here we go. Okay, so here we go. Again, just watch the referee of when he throws the flag. You'll see him at the top of your screen here. There's the hold. There's the flag. Why? Again, we're going to watch it again. Look where the hold is. The hold is pretty early on in this clip. No flag comes in, right? Right there. There's where he should have thrown it. There's the interception. There's now he's going to throw the flag. Why? Why? I don't understand. Am I missing something on that? Maybe I am. 
Maybe I am. I don't know. But I'm telling you right now, Dean Blandino didn't even agree with it. They had him on the game, and, and he, he did not agree with it. But so many people were very frustrated with that call, and it's just a bad look for the NFL. It really is. It's a bad look because it just... That's not what you want to see. In a, in a big game like that, New York was playing well. Zach Wilson was playing well. Would have been a great story in New York against Kansas City. I mean, if Kansas City loses that game, how much different would people be feeling about Kansas City right now? I mean, you had Patrick Mahomes not playing a great game. It would have been their second loss already in the season. They would have lost to a Jets team that nobody had any confidence in. The storylines are completely different. But now, Kansas City walks out of there 3-1. and one. Zach Wilson has the fumble, and that's all anybody's talking about now. It's like, it's just, it's so crazy how little moments in a game can completely change the narrative of how the game went or what people took away from it. But, yeah, that was a horrible call. Horrible. Let's talk about Monday night. Monday night, the Seattle Seahawks, who, again, look, let's, let's call it what it is, man. These guys are having a great season. Giants, not so much. Seahawks go to 3-1. and one, Giants go to 1-3. and three. Seattle, 5-0 and oh at MetLife Stadium and 700% winning percentage on Monday nights. So they, they have a good record on Monday night, especially at home. Saquon Barkley was still out, of course, with his ankle injury, thinking he might come back this week. If not, definitely, I would say by week six. Seattle's defense completely dominated the Jets, Giants O-line. 11 sacks and 14 quarterback hits. That is domination. Daniel Jones, look. Daniel Jones is not playing well. But let's also be fair and say Daniel Jones is getting no protection whatsoever. 203 yards, no touchdowns, two picks. One did go all the way back, pick six. But Daniel Jones was also the Giants' leading rusher, which I don't know what that tells you. 66 yards by Daniel Jones. Matt Breida, 14 carries, only ended up with 30. Geno Smith, who did get banged up in this game, but did return, so I think we're, I think he's good to go. But it was a little concerning at first. Looked like he had a leg injury, but uh, he, like I say, he came back. On the day, not overly impressive. 13 to 20, 110 yards, one touchdown. Drew Locke came in for a little bit, went two for six, 63 yards. Kenneth Walker, 17 carries, 79 yards, one touchdown. Giants defense, actually... If we want to take anything away from the Giants, they actually did a pretty good job containing Lockett and Metcalf. Lockett and Metcalf combined had seven catches, 88 yards, one touchdown. So they didn't run away with this thing. The Giants' defense was trying to hold on and keep their team in this game. But again, a pick six, 11 sacks. I mean, just it was domination. So congratulations to the Seattle Seahawks because they really did have a very nice game and they are now 3 and 1. So they deserve all the accolades that they are getting. Week four injuries. This is all of them of people that were injured in games. I've highlighted some of the bigger names that you should be watching for if you're in fantasy. Uh, Brian Branch, of course, from the Lions, his ankle. Like I say, we're hoping for good news with that. Luke Musgrave, the Packers tight end, concussion. Broncos running back Javante Williams has a hip injury. That could be concerning. Panthers, Dante Jackson. Shoulder and Adam Thielen ankle. Miles Garrett, defensive end for the Browns, has a foot injury. Steelers tight end, Pat Fryermuth, hamstring injury. Also, Kenny Pickett, his leg. Uh, he was limping around, so we'll watch for that. 
Buccaneers wide receiver Mike Evans, hamstring injury. Bengals wide receiver T. Higgins, injured ribs. Raiders wide receiver Devontae Adams, shoulder injury. And the Patriots linebacker Matthew Judon, injured elbow. And then all the other injuries here too as well. But those are the main ones that uh, I felt like we should probably call out. Um, but yeah, definitely the Devontae Williams one, that I that didn't sound real good to me. So we'll see. Anytime a running back gets a hip injury, I just it's it's concerning for sure. And then the Luke Musgrave, that's a big loss for the Green Bay Packers right now, as uh, he was off to a pretty good start this season. Shouts out of the week. I know there would should have been more, but uh, just a couple. I don't want to overdo this, but just a quick couple that I wanted to throw out there. And of course, we had to put a lion on there after that big win, but it was actually on the defensive side of the ball. Jerry Jacobs, two interceptions against the Packers. He had just one interception in his previous two seasons, and he gets two in one game. So great job for Jerry Jacobs, who's having a great season, by the way. And then, of course, the Buffalo Bills with their big win over the Dolphins. I had to give them a shout-out. Josh Allen, again, 21-25, 320 yards, four touchdowns, four carries, 17 yards, one touchdown. And then Stefan Diggs, six catches on seven targets, 120 yards, three touchdowns. Big shout outs to those players there. Power rankings. I've got a new way I'm going to show the power rankings because I just wasn't happy with uh, what I was presenting and how it was. It just wasn't a good read. So again, I say I'm going to improve this show every week if I have to. And this is one improvement I'm doing this week. And this is how we'll do it moving forward. The power rankings of the week, and I'm just going to highlight the ones that really made some major moves. Um, the Buccaneers, the Buccaneers who were ranked 20th last week, moved all the way up to 10th. That's big. That is a big move. And they started out the season ranked 28th. So they've already moved in four weeks, 18 spots up. Texans. Last week, we're ranked 23rd. They are now 15th. Again, I'm a big fan of the Texans. I've been saying the Texans are dangerous. And it looks like they're finally starting to get some recognition as well. That's an eight-spot jump. They were actually ranked 31st at the start of the season. So they have moved up 16 spots. The Rams. The Rams were tough to, to get a read on. And after that loss last week, they really dropped 24, 24th uh, in the power rankings last week. They move up to 17th. So they have uh, improved seven spots. And they were actually ranked 30th at the start of the season. So they have improved 13 spots. Now for the not-so-goods. The Bengals. The Bengals uh, went from 11th place in the power rankings down to 20th. I'm not sure that's even far enough. I think they should go farther, but so far they're at 20. That's nine spots they dropped. Since the start of the season, they have dropped 15 spots. They came into the season fifth on the power rankings. Big, big drop. The Steelers also dropped seven spots. They went from 16th to 23rd. They have dropped nine spots since the start of the season. Vikings. Vikings, well, they only dropped one spot from last week, or actually, uh, they moved up one spot from last week, but they have dropped 10 spots since the start of the season. They came in 15th. They are now 25th. And then the last one I want to mention, the Giants. Uh, they have lost 11 spots since the start of the season. They were 19th coming in. They are now 30th. 30th. The Bears, look, the Bears are holding it down at 32. They're probably going to hold it there for a while. Broncos, I guess, in that game, just because they were the worst of the, the last two. were. I want to say they were, uh, where were they last week? 31. Yeah, they were. 
They were 31, Bears were 32. So with the win, the Broncos moved up uh, three spots. They're 28th. And then since this is a Lions show, Lions held their spot. They are number seven in the power rankings. That's where they were last week. And they have moved up four spots since the start of the season. They came in ranked 11th. I said that wasn't good enough. And they are showing it. And I also said they should have been ranked above the Seahawks. And currently they are. So, so far I'm right on that. We look at the standings around the league real quick here. AFC, the Buffalo Bills and Dolphins are tied at 3-1. and one, But with the win this week, the Buffalo Bills do hold the tiebreaker advantage. But, of course, they will play again later this season. We'll see what happens with that. The New England Patriots and New York Jets are both at 1-3. and three. In the North, it's the Baltimore Ravens at 3-1, and one, the Steelers at 2-2, two and two, the Browns at 2-2, two and two, the Bengals at 1-3. and three. I actually still like the Browns more than the Steelers in that one. I think they're the second best team, and I think that will play out. Really, the Bengals guys at this point, they're just going to have to show me something. I'm not I'm not saying their turnaround is is a definite. I think it's surprising that they haven't turned things around, but as of right now, I've got to go by what I'm seeing and what I'm I'm seeing is absolutely a one and three team. In the South, it's the Colts, the Jaguars, the Texans, and yes, the Titans, all at two and two. Net points, the Colts have uh, scored two less points than their opponents. The Jaguars have as well. The Texans have outscored their opponents by 17, and the Titans have outscored their opponents by two. So very interesting there. I really like the Texans. I still like the Jaguars too. I think the Jaguars, um, I don't know what happened to them a couple of those weeks. I think they, they just looked flat. They just didn't look ready. Um, where, to me, the Texans have, I think, been the most consistent team uh, week in, week out of what they go and feature on that field. Um, but I think all four of these teams are going to be in a tight race all season. I want to say the Titans are the weak link of this division. But look, they're 2-2 two and two right now, and they've actually outscored their opponents, where the Jacksonville Jaguars and the Colts haven't. So I'll give it to the t- Titans. I could be uh, under-ranking them right now. In the West, it's the Chiefs at the top, three and one. The Chargers are two and two, and the Raiders and Broncos are one and three. And I think that seems exactly right. I feel like that's exactly where all these teams should be. Um, if if the Raiders can't get Garoppolo back, they're going to have major problems. Uh, they are outscored by their opponents right now, thirty nine points. The Broncos outscored by their opponents, fifty points. The Chiefs have outscored their opponents 41 points. So that tells you the scope kind of of where all these teams are. There's a big gap between one and four. Let's put it that way. We go to the NFC. It is the Philadelphia Eagles, the uh, one of the last teams holding undefeated. Them and the 49ers. But the Eagles 4-0. Cowboys are 3-1. Commanders are two and two. The Giants are one and three. Like I say, the Giants with that offensive line, that team's not going to win much, and especially without Saquon Barkley. Commanders are surprising. I like what the Commanders have out there. I think they've got some definite potential, um, but right now they're being outscored by their opponents by thirty-one points. So they've got to they've got to finish their drives. Right now, I feel like they can put some good drives together, but they never maximize their scoring, and that just comes out to keep them kind of losing games that maybe they should be winning. Cowboys, super good, super tough. Uh, I, I got a ton of confidence in this team. And then Eagles, also very, very good team. And if Jalen Hurts continues to play like he did this past week, the Eagles will fly. Lions 3 and 1, Packers 2 and 2, Vikings 1 and 3, Bears 0 and 4. That to me, I think that's how this division's going to go all season long. I think when we rack this at the end of the season, that's going to be the standings just like it is right now. I do not see that changing. 
And that is not what I predicted. So look, I would like it to change because my prediction looks really bad right now. But uh, no, I, I do believe after watching these four teams for four weeks, I do believe this is going to be the standings we have when all is said and done. Buccaneers, 3-1. and one, Falcons, 2-2. Two and two, Saints, 2-2. Two and two, Carolina Panthers, 0-4. I actually think the Carolina Panthers are better than 0-4. I really do. I, I really think this team has some young talent. They're just young, and that's going to be their problem right now. Um, they've, they've got a lot of growing to do, but I do think the future looks good for the Panthers. Um, the Saints, I'm actually not real high on. I just There's something about the Saints I just, uh, you know, I, I've we'll see. We'll see. I, I don't want to say too much uh, because they just got Kamara back, and I think he is a big piece that could make this offense look a lot better. Uh, so we'll wait and see on that. The Falcons, again, I think they're just one two-dimensional right now. I think they are a running team. The problem is when they fall behind and they can't run as much as they need to, it gets them into trouble. Tampa Bay, look, ride it. Ride the wave that you are on. I don't think anybody expected this out of Tampa, but I don't feel like it's a false flag. I feel like this is a real good team, and it's just surprising people. And then in the West, it's a 49ers 4-0, Seahawks 3-1, Rams two and two, Cardinals one and three. This one could get all scrambled up by the end of the season. I do think 49ers are probably the big dog on the block in this one, and they look really good right now. I just I do worry about their depth if they get any injuries. That's my concern about the 49ers. Other than that, if they stay pretty healthy, I think this team can run uh run with this division. But Seahawks, Rams, and Cardinals. I think you can put those in any order at the end of the season and, and they could really mix it up. So uh, that's the standings. But yeah, some really, really good teams, some really, really bad teams, and then a lot of just kind of going to be dogging it out in the middle of the, of the divisions to, to win it. But I do think the uh, NFC North has been decided. Week five. Here we go. Week five. Power rankings, I do not have on here anymore. I took that off to clean it up. And, of course, we already looked at the power rankings. Uh, but Thursday night, it's the Bears at the Commanders. I, I like the Commanders in this one big time. Uh, like I say, I think they've done really good. I think Sam Howell's good. Uh, they've got a good running back. Defense has been impressive at times. And the Bears have just been horrible. So uh, if the Bears pull this one off, I would be shocked. Plus, it's in Washington. Sunday. We've got another game from London. Jaguars spent the time over there. They're sticking around. And they are going to be welcoming in the Red Hot Buffalo Bills. Uh, it's going to be interesting because, like I say, the Jaguars looked really good last week. And so if the Jaguars are playing their best game against a good Bills team, I think this could be a very interesting game. But I'm telling you, the Bills defense, they're locked in right now. And the fact that the Jaguars have been a little wishy-washy early in the season, I don't have a good feeling for them in this one. I think the Bills will run away with this one. And then we go to the 1 o'clock games on Sunday. It's the Titans at the Colts. That's a great division rivalry there. Um, I'll be very interested to see how uh, they play. Titans, I got to say, might be coming in the hotter of the two teams, though. Saints at Patriots. Man, uh, Mac Jones. I, I'm so... So let down by Mac Jones and his performance that th this is going to be a tough one to watch too. Uh, if the Saints can can get going early with Kamara, they could run in the ball against the Patriots all day and maybe just control the clock. And and I don't know. I just the Patriots have to show me something. And I really had them red raw in the first two weeks. They look nothing like the team I was uh, excited about. Not at all. Ravens at Steelers again. Kenny Pickett's got to figure it out. He's got to uh, he he's got to play better. Let's just call it what it is. Like we can't we can't hide it. He's he's the leader of this team. Should be the leader of this team. He's not, and and they've been losing games because of it. Ravens come in. Ravens are a good team, so I like the Ravens in this one to go on the road and win. Texans at Falcons. These are two teams that right now I love watching. I, I, I have respect for both of them because I do love the Falcons running game. I love the running game. I love watching Bijan run the ball. But I just feel like that's also their weakness is that's really all they can do. 
Texans, on the other hand, C.J. Stroud, I'm telling you, this guy is legit. He is a real deal quarterback in the NFL, and the Texans are definitely feeding off of his energy. I like the Texans in this one. Giants at Dolphins. The Dolphins, look, they got beat by the Buffalo Bills, but we should not forget who they are. This is a very, very good team that's probably really ready to uh, put up another big game. They're going against a Giants team that, look, the Giants defense did a good job uh, for what they were for what they were dealt with, but their offensive line is horrible. I think the Dolphins defense goes off in this one, has a huge day. Dolphins get back on the winning side of the ball. Four o'clock games. It's the Bengals at the Cardinals. Bengals have been garbage. Cardinals, surprising. Got the big win over the uh, Cowboys a couple weeks ago. I like the Cardinals in this one for sure. Eagles at Rams. I think this is a surprising game. This could be a really, really good tight game. Could have overtime in this one. I think both offenses are ready to light it up. And I think both can. So now that I, I'm pretty confident Matthew Stafford is healthy, not injured, um, like I say, that puts a whole different level to the Rams for me. And uh, the Eagles, they've been doing it night, uh, week in, week out. So uh, this one may be too close to call. I don't know. I guess I'll go Eagles. But I would not be shocked if the Rams uh, get an upset here. 425 games. It's the Jets at the Broncos. Again, two horrible teams. Can the Broncos win two in a row and, and start getting those Funny little feelings in their feet. Well, maybe, but again, they're playing the Jets. And I'll tell you right now, with the way Zach Wilson played, don't count the Jets out because the Jets' defense actually looked good too. So can the Jets go on the road to Denver and get a win? Yeah, I think they can. I think that's actually possible. Um, And you know what? Let me do it. I'm going to say the Jets. I'm going to say the Jets get a win in Denver. How about that? Chiefs at Vikings. Again, if the Vikings would stop turning the ball over, I might actually have a, a chance of uh, saying that they could win a game, but it definitely won't be this one. Not against the Chiefs. Chiefs come in. They just got off a pretty ugly game against the Jets and still won that one. They definitely can go in and they can beat the Vikings because the Chiefs defense, don't forget, we always talk about the Chiefs offense. The Chiefs defense, very sneaky. And with the Vikings turning the ball over, I think the Chiefs will oblige and uh, might even get a pick six in this one. The 8 o'clock Sunday night game, Cowboys at 49ers, the game of the week. This is the one that everybody should be watching because this is just going to be a good old-fashioned football game. There's no doubt. These two teams have history, and uh, it's going to be a fun game to watch for sure. Uh, pretty much, I think both these teams are fairly uh, healthy as well. And uh, in San Francisco, Cowboys come visiting. Cowboys have that bad taste from the loss to the Cardinals. I guarantee you still in their minds, they're thinking they should be undefeated. And guess what? The 49ers are undefeated. So you don't think the Cowboys want to come in here and give the 49ers their first loss at home? Absolutely they do. This will be a a war on that field. And then finally, the week wraps up on Monday night. Packers heading to Las Vegas to take on the Raiders. And I'm telling you, I think the Packers get back on the winning track here. Uh, Jordan Love should have a big game. The Raiders, lots of questions for this team. I am not impressed. And uh, so I think the Packers get a win in this one. Bye weeks do start this week, so don't forget, adjust your fantasy football teams accordingly. Bye weeks are the Cleveland Browns, the San Diego, or the Los Angeles Chargers, Seattle Seahawks, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So again, adjust your lineups accordingly. Now we get into week five preview. Carolina Panthers visiting the Detroit Lions at Ford Field. Let's first talk about the Detroit Lions injuries heading into week five. Did not pre now let me preface this. It is only Tuesday, guys. So I have a hard time with 
uh, injury reports because we really don't get injury reports by the time I record. But at the same time, I don't want to wait later in the week just to discuss injuries when it would really put me behind the eight ball of getting the show out in a good enough time for giving people time to watch it. So I am choosing to just kind of have to hand dig my own injury reports and really kind of just read a lot, look up each player kind of separately, go through who got injured in the week previous, update from the injury report previous. So there's a lot that goes into it, but I just feel like this is the best way for me to be able to bring you guys the most accurate information but keep in mind, this is very early in the week. So a lot of these injuries could change. But at the time I'm recording this, this is what I got for you. So let's go with who did not practice uh, today. And now keep in mind as well, the Lions normally don't practice on Mondays. They start practicing on Tuesdays. But because they had the Thursday night game, they did go in on a Monday practice. So that's why there is some uh, report coming out of who was at practice and who wasn't because they actually did have a practice on Monday. So here we go. Did not practice. Amon Ross St. Brown. We know he's been dealing with a toe injury. I don't think this is anything too um, serious, but it was noted that he was actually just doing side work with trainers and he was running at about 70 to 80% speed. So again, I think this is more just precautionary. It's getting him work, but they don't want to overwork that toe. They want to give it enough rest. So I think he will be okay and good to go. Brian Branch, here's my concern. He was not seen at practice at all. He had a major ankle injury. It didn't look good. He kind of was battling with it all game, came in and out twice in that game. The second time he left, he did not come back. A lot of people were wondering why we even brought him back out when we were you know, pretty much handing it to Green Bay. They didn't feel like it was necessary, but... Uh, we, we, we want Brian Branch back, so hopefully this is just precautionary, but definitely one that I would tell you guys, pay attention to throughout the week, and uh, the injury reports probably will be updated every day on Brian Branch. He's that important. Jason Cabinda, fullback, he also was doing side work with the trainers. He is dealing with a knee injury. If he can't go, Daryl Daniels, who we signed last week, will definitely be back in there. And he was very serviceable. Shout out to Daryl uh, Daniels because you really didn't notice him. And that's what a good fullback does. You don't notice him. He's not getting holding calls. He's not getting, uh, you know, ran over. He 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 did a very serviceable job. So we'll see if uh, Jason Kapinda can uh, up his health level. But if not, Daryl Daniels will be back in there. Players that returned to practice. Well, the big news around the week, of course, was that Jameson Williams, his suspension is over. That's right. His suspension is done. Uh, They adjusted the rule, and somehow it ended his suspension immediately. So he is now available for the Lions. Now, the question is, though, will he be activated this week? They're saying they don't know, because even if he's activated... They're thinking that his uh, snap count would be very limited, very limited, because he's just making his return. He also was dealing with a hamstring injury, don't forget. So they probably want to be very careful that they're not going to rush him back if he's not really stretched out and good to go. So this week, maybe not. And again, this will be updated throughout the week, so definitely follow along. But I think a lot of people thought when they saw, hey, suspension's over, he's going back in and he was just going to step right in, it's starting to sound like that might not be the case. He may be a week away yet. Halapulivati Vitae, possibly on track to return. He had the knee injury. He's been out a couple weeks, but they're saying he is possible to return. He was actually at practice, and he looked good from the early parts of the week. Now, again, early in the week, so... He could have a, a, you know, something act up on him, and this whole thing could be right back to where he began. But early reports are he's back on track. Uh, if he can't go, of course, Graham Glasgow will be back in there again. And again, he's been doing very, very good. Very good. Julian Aquara has been designated to return from IR, from his uh, arm injury. 
But keep in mind, just because he's designated to return does not mean he is back yet. He can practice now is what that means, but he still has another three weeks that he's got to be off before he can come back into the game. So until he returns, Derek Barnes will continue to play at defensive end for the Lions. Safety Kirby Joseph, barring any setback, he also appears ready to return. Um, he's dealing with a hip injury. Uh, Melifonwu would be the one that will continue to play there until Kirby Joseph can come back. But again, when you think of how well we're playing, guys, think of how well we are playing. And think of all the players that we don't have in there right now. So this team... I want I point that out because this is what I'm talking about when I say this team has depth. They have depth. We're playing with that depth right now, and we're playing very, very well. Other notables at practice were Taylor Decker, ankle injury. He's he was actually at practice, so that's a good sign. Emmanuel Mosley, who initially was coming back from an ACL and then injured his hamstring during the recovery from the ACL. I think he there's a good chance that he gets in this weekend. So we'll see. Cornerback for the Lions. Uh, we definitely could use. We definitely can get more depth in our secondary right now with some of the injuries we've been dealing with. And then Khalil Dorsey, who actually was said to have an illness, but went on the IR for it. He is eligible to come off the IR next week. So again, more depth for our secondary will be coming back. So that's good. The Panthers injury report. Safter, safety Xavier Woods, hamstring, did not play in week four. Now, the Panthers did not have a practice on Monday. So that's why I've got very limited information on them. But I am very confident that of the injuries they have, I've got listed right here. The Panthers are actually coming in. Very, very healthy. So we're going off of the players that were either injured in week four or were injured prior to week four and kind of what we know about those injuries heading into week five. So Xavier Woods did not play in week four at all. He was dealing with the hamstring injury. So will he come back in week five? I haven't seen anything that says that. The other one I don't think that will be back in week five is wide receiver Jonathan Mingo. He's dealing with a concussion still, so I would doubt he's going to return. Players that got injured in week four, Dante Jackson, cornerback, injured his shoulder. He left the game in the first half. He never returned. So we'll see how bad that injury is. And then J.C. Horn, he, I guarantee you, I don't think he's going to play. He's got a major hamstring injury that he's been dealing with. And so he's been off for, I want to say, since week one. So he's been banged up for a while. I don't see anything that says he's going to play either. But that's it. That's all they've got for their injury report. And that was me just digging to find out who's been injured, who got injured, all that. This is it. So they look, like I say, they look fairly healthy going into this game. Guys, head to head, Lions, Panthers. Offensive total yards, Lions, 1,545 to the Panthers, 1,130. Offensive passing yards, Lions, look at that, one yard away from 1,000, 999 versus the Panthers, 749 yards. Offensive passing touchdowns, the Lions have six offensive passing touchdowns, the Panthers four. The top rushing offense in the league, the Detroit Lions, 546 rushing yards already, just four weeks in, the Panthers 381. Rushing touchdowns, look at this, the Lions, six rushing touchdowns, the Panthers only one rushing touchdown so far this season. Points scored by the offenses so far this season. The Lions, 106 points. The Panthers, 67. 
penalties against. The Panthers have had 34 penalties called on them. The Lions, just 26. Quarterback rating heading into this game, the Lions, and, well, Jared Goff, since he's been the only quarterback so far, 98.4 to 79.8. Interceptions thrown this season. The Panthers have thrown two interceptions. The Lions have thrown three. Fumbles on the season. Both teams have, they've actually fumbled more. So this is only the fumbles that they lost. So if you look in the stat sheet, you might see the Lions, I think, had like four fumbles this season. But they only lost three of them. So that's all we're counting here is how many fumbles actually lost. The Lions, three. The Panthers, three. Times sacked. So this is how many times the, their quarterbacks have been sacked. So Jared Goff has been sacked five times thanks to his offensive line. The Panthers have given up 14 sacks this season. Talk about third down conversions. Who's better at this? Well, offensively, the Panthers are just a smidge in front of the Detroit Lions. 39.3 to 38.6. You can see below uh, the Panthers, 24 of 61. Lions, 22 of 57. So very, very close in this stat. Fourth down conversions. You know this is my favorite stat. Fourth down conversions, the Panthers 43%, Lions are 50%, Panthers are 3 of 7, Lions are 4, 4, 8. Who puts the biscuit in the basket? Who scores touchdowns in the red zone? The Lions 53.3% of the time, Panthers 44.4% of the time. You can see again below, it is the Carolina Panthers 4 for 9, the Lions are 8 for 15. And who says kickers don't matter? The kickers matter in this one. The Lions, 100% so far this season, 5 for 5, 38 being so far his longest. The Panthers, 8 for 9, 56 yards being his longest. Panero actually just missed uh, his kick last week. So let's hope he's having an issue. Uh, and he carries that over to this week. We'll see. All right, now let's go to the defensive side of the ball. On defense, yards allowed. The Lions have allowed 1,122 offensive total yards. The Panthers have allowed 1,252 total yards. Defensive passing yards allowed. The Lions have allowed 879 passing yards. The Panthers have only allowed 707 yards, which also leads to, well, Fewer touchdowns by the Panthers. They've only given up four passing touchdowns. The Lions have given up five. Rushing yards allowed. The Panthers have given up 545 rushing yards. That is a great sign for us. The Detroit Lions have only given up 243 rushing yards in four games. That is a great stat. And that is a huge turnaround from last year, if you guys remember. So much, much better defense against the run this year. Rushing touchdowns. The Panthers have given up six rushing touchdowns. The Lions have given up three. Points scored against. The Lions have allowed 83 points to be put up on them. The Panthers have allowed 102. Interceptions for the defense. The Lions have intercepted four or three passes, excuse me, this season. The Panthers have allowed or have gotten four interceptions this season. So advantage Panthers in that category. Sacks. The Detroit Lions have gotten 13 sacks on the season. The Panthers have gotten 12. So very close in this stat. How do the defenses hold up on third down? Well, the Lions allow the opposing team to convert on third down 34% of the time. The Panthers, very good on this stat, actually. 27.7% of the time are they allowing a uh, third down conversion. Fourth down conversion, the Lions, 50% of the time you can convert on fourth down against them. 66.7% of the time you can convert against the Panthers. 
Well, let's not. Let's hope uh, Dan Campbell does not see this because that'll make him want to do it even more. Uh, the Panthers have had three attempts. They have allowed two of them. The Lions, of course, have had four attempts against them, and they have allowed two of them. If you're in the red zone against the Lions, well, the chances of you scoring are actually pretty good. 61.5%. The Panthers, 60%. So neither team really good defensively in the red zone. And finally, you know I like the pressure by the defense, so I like to measure quarterback hits. In this category, the Lions lead it. 27 quarterback hits. The Panthers have 23. And finally, going head-to-head with the league ranks in these categories, you can see the Lions run away with it. 11 categories they win versus just three for the Panthers. Which three did the Panthers take? Yards after catch, they are ranked 16th. The Lions are ranked 21st. Passing yards against, they are ranked 6th. The Lions are ranked 17th. And passing touchdowns against, they are ranked 8th. The Lions are ranked 14th. What I want to point out is the Lions are ranked 1st at rushing yards against. So that's why I said the best rushing defense in the NFL. Yes, they are. Uh, Also, we are 4th in total yards allowed on defense, which is a very good stat. We are 4th in rushing touchdowns. We are 6th in yards after contact. We are 8th in points scored. We are 8th in passing yards offensively. And we are 8th in total yards offensively. So this is a top 10 offense, no doubt. And look at our defense even. Look at our defense. Remember the last year, our defense was ranked like pretty much 30th and lower <laughs> in every defensive category? Look at us now. We're, we're like middle of the pack. And I'm telling you, a lot of that happened in that Seattle game. So I said it last week, and I believe it happened. We continue to move up in the rankings on defense. We're going to continue to do that even more after this coming week. I guarantee it. So very impressive stuff for the Detroit Lions. All right, guys, that is going to uh, wrap up the show. I'm very excited about this weekend, no doubt about it. The, The Carolina Panthers... Do not scare me against this Lions team. Uh, We've got some guys coming back. Uh, Look, the the big injury that I'm looking for, Brian Branch. Is Brian Branch playing or not? Uh, That's the only one that I really have concerns about. If he doesn't, look, it's next man up. We'll figure it out. We've got depth, and we're going to need to use it. But uh, I would prefer not to because I really enjoy watching Brian Branch play. He is just a special, special player that we got so lucky to get in the draft. And... um, I really think the the big thing that we're going to do this week is run. We can run the ball again on this defense. And we've got a running attack that is absolutely built to just beat down defenses. And what that's also going to do is it's going to control the clock. And what that's also going to do is it's going to open up our passing uh, offense over the top. So it's going to be really tough for teams to... Uh, dial in and try and stop the Lions because if the if you stop the run, we're going to be able to pass against you. And if you can't stop the run, we're still going to be able to pass. I mean, we've got a prolific offense, prolific offense. And Jared Goff, look, yeah, he's thrown some interceptions this year. That has been, you know, not his nature in the past, but um, that's okay. We'll figure it out. And we've got a great defense that can, uh, you know, get holds on the opposing offenses when they do get uh, turnovers on us. So, so far, it has not really uh, been a major factor. Like I say, the only factor that has really affected us this season has been bad coaching calls. And I feel like Dan Campbell's learned from that. I think Dan Campbell has settled down a little bit again, like uh, he did last year, which I was a much bigger fan of. Um, I still like Dan Campbell. I think he's a hell of a coach. I, I love his energy. I love the way he manages this ball club. I love the way his par- uh, players carry themselves. So there's a lot to like in Dan Campbell. I just don't like Dan Gamble. I like Dan Campbell. <laughs> when Dan Gamble shows up, I'm not such a fan. You know, and I just, I you know my reasons. 
So I won't bore you with the details again. But yes, I think the Lions have a big win this week. I think we move on. We're going to move up in the power rankings. We're going to move up in the standings as far as um, in the, uh, the categories, the stats, the defensive stats, the offensive stats. I think we move up in those. I think people start taking us even more serious. I really think we, we proved something by going to Green Bay, getting such a big win. Um, I saw a lot of just major media talking about the Detroit Lions in positive light. No more jokes about us. Um, it seems like those days are quickly fading away, as, as they should be. Um, the one thing I did want to mention real quick, too, was uh, Fitzpatrick, Ryan Fitzpatrick. If you didn't see um, on the Thursday night pregame show, he referred to Jared Goff as a poor man's Matt Ryan. And I cannot think of who the offensive lineman is that's on that pregame show, but he used to play with Jared Goff in St. Louis or L.A. at the time, I think it was. Um, I can't remember. They've gone back and forth so much. But either way, when they were with the Rams. And uh, you could tell he was kind of uh, taken back by the comment because he actually kind of made like a grunt noise or something when, when Fitzpatrick said that. And then Fitzpatrick quickly tried to say, well, I don't mean that as a bad thing. I just, you know, well, at the end of the game, Jared Goff and David Montgomery uh, went up for a post-game interview at the panel. And Jared Goff actually mentioned the comment. And you could tell Fitzpatrick was kind of thrown off that he already had heard about it, which I'm going to guess was from uh, the other panelists that I can't think of the name. And uh, I got respect for Jared Goff. Jared Goff is not going to just get talked about or ran over. Jared Goff has fire in him. And we've seen that a few times after some big wins. He'll, you know, be through yelling at the crowd and telling people to get excited. And, you know, he, he gets animated at times, but he carries himself very controlled on the field. And I like that. I like the fact that he knows in between the lines, I've got to play level-headed, you know, clean, smart, whatever. But outside the lines, if you want to mix it up with them, he'll mix it up with you. And uh, so Jared Goff, I just, I got nothing but respect for this guy. I'm absolutely 100% behind him as our quarterback. And uh, I just can't wait to see what the future holds for, for not just this, just the team, but for him, for the coaching staff, for the city. I mean, everybody needs to get on this Detroit Lions train because this is one of the biggest, most just incredible electric atmospheres when they're playing at home. It's ridiculous how loud this crowd is. It's hard to hear the announcers at times because the crowd is so loud. And you just don't get that in the NFL everywhere. So the Lions are bringing a special, special energy right now. And it's because of the excitement that this team is providing for the fans. So enjoy the show. Enjoy the ride. Lions, I believe, will go to 4-1 uh, and one on the season after this week. And uh, I don't like to guarantee a lot of stuff, but damn it, I'm guaranteeing this one. And uh, so just enjoy, and uh, we will catch you guys next week and uh, another full show for you. So, again, thank you for all the support, though, guys. And, again, if you want to have your opinions heard, call me, 616-258-63. Say it with me, 86. 616-258-63. Eight, six. And also, don't forget to leave your waiter a tip in the tip jar. All right, guys. Thank you. And until next week, this is Mario Romanelli telling you to take care of yourselves and each other. But for now, I am 